fall army worm this like you say it's not getting a worm in the apple this is going to bed at night and waking up the next day and your crops are gone these things it's that fast these things are like a blanket on the field when they come this is the vance crow podcast Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. On Wednesdays, I sit down with an expert to figure out what is it that they know? How did they learn this deep field of study? And what should we know about that's going on in the world that we might not have access to if we aren't an expert like you are in your field? And this week, I sat down with University of Florida plant scientist named Kevin Folta, who is a prolific researcher, a teacher, and a science communicator that is known around the United States and really all over the world for his exceptional ability to take really complicated ideas in plant science, in domestication of animals, all sorts of topics, and turn them into stories that other people can understand, appreciate, and even maybe begin to change their perspective on things like the value of modern agricultural technologies. Now, Kevin and I have known each other for several years, which makes an interview like this sometimes a little bit difficult, because in order to make it interesting, not only for you, but for me, I have to be asking questions that I don't already know the answer to. And because Kevin and I have spent so much time together, many of the things that I think are interesting, I've already heard him talk about before. So today, I tried to venture into areas that I haven't asked him about before, or if I did know it, I was able to bring a level of skepticism to my questions that maybe normally in a conversation I would let pass. So what you might observe during this interview is that I poke Kevin quite a bit. I push him on uh, the value of things like vitamin A um, being put into bananas to, to cure vitamin A deficiency. And we talk all about, you know, what is the value of farmers going out and talking about their stories or sharing their Um, farms and the work that they do on things like YouTube. What is the value of that? And ultimately, we start talking at the very end about some controversy that Kevin got himself into. I tried really pretty hard not to make this interview about the controversy. There is so much stuff out there about uh, Kevin Fulta being a science communicator that is known around the world. He's talked about in the New York Times, in BuzzFeed. He's had uh, major lawsuits happen all around him. So he's out there, and if you wanted to go look him up, that's okay. But I thought for this interview that what we would do is really stay and talk about if you were embroiled in controversy, What did you learn uh, about what you could have done better, what you could do more, so that others that are listening can maybe miss some of the pitfalls that happened to him? So we don't spend too much time. The rest of it is all on science and application and fascinating ideas that Kevin knows about. You will see right away why Kevin is a world-recognized expert, and I am so glad that you have joined me today. So buckle in and enjoy a very different ag communications science conversation with my friend, Dr. Kevin Fulta. Dr. Kevin Fulta, welcome to the podcast. Oh, this is so cool. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's great to have you here. It's uh, just a quick trip. You're heading to Mizzou? Yeah, over University of Missouri. I'm giving a talk about research from the lab for once rather than communications. And what sort of research are you going to be reporting on? All of it. Um, it's actually really cool. I'm, I normally don't like to do this. I usually like to focus on one of the projects from the lab, but I'm going to talk a little bit about everything. I kind of do a lazy Susan of science, and I don't normally like to do that because it comes off a little bit surfacey when scientists like to dig deep. But there's a the message is more for the grad students who invited me that um, you got to sometimes think outside the box and then color outside the lines, and th- so that's kind of where the overarching message needs that kind of more surface treatment. And so your lab is at the University of Florida. What sort of projects are you working on there? Well, we do three things. And and, and so funny that, well, well, we'll talk about this in a minute. We do three things. Uh, we work on, first, the way light controls traits in plants. And this has never been more important because of vertical farming. And we are rewriting the book on how vertical farming works in terms of the lighting and the plants that you use. We're really contributing to that. We're doing a lot with genomics and strawberry, which means understanding the genes that are present and how they contribute to important traits like flavor or disease resistance. So we study that, and that's mostly computational tools these days. But then the third thing we do is super cool. 
we make new proteins that the world has never, universe has never seen, likely, from random DNA information. And we put random DNA information into plants and into bacteria just to see what happens. And once in a while it does something beneficial. A lot of the times it does something deleterious. But in an age of um, no new herbicides and no new antibiotics, being able to kill something you don't want there is actually a good thing. So you're uh, making transgenics there then. You're, that, that's like a, the core, a GMO. That's right. They are transgenics, about. but that's just because that's the fastest way to help us create the new chemistry in the place where the chemistry works. So in other words, all the big companies are trying, spraying everything they can on plants to see if it'll kill it, especially things that are registered for human consumption. You know, uh, medicines that are safe for humans, do they do something to a plant just collaterally? But what we're doing is we're letting the plants, we're, we're transforming thousands of Arabidopsis, a little mustard plant. We're putting the gene in the thousands of different plants where each plant gives you a new peptide, a little protein, from the random information we put in. And once in a while, one of them makes more flowers. Another one grows really funny with a different leaf, leaf shape. Another hyperaccumulates pigment. Another one dies. The ones that die say that we've introduced a cluster of chemistry that somehow mucked up the mechanics of the machine. And it gives us a new target where now people who know more about chemistry can exploit that target to design new herbicides that may be specific to plants and very um, safe for the environment and for people. So is this just going on in mass? So when you have a pesticide company, they're trying to discover a new a new chemistry. They are trying out any, anything they can get their hands on just randomly out there or they, they have a, a circle around parts that they think are more promising than others. I mean... Well, I think they do like gauntlet type work. They use these libraries of chemicals. I mean, you're describing the laboratory that I had when I was in second grade, when I'm going outside and spraying hairspray on the lawn or totally, you know, like that, that, it's that random. That's where it is now. It's you're trying to take anything that's safe for humans and see if it has another application because going through the approval process is so rough and there's dozens of companies in the space. They're doing what's called chemical genomics, putting chemistry on to see if it has an effect. And once in a while it does, we're doing the opposite. We're creating novel chemistries that never existed in the world before inside the plant and seeing if it has an effect. Okay. So it's, so this is a way of kind of flipping that upside down. So somebody that is, um, Less trusting in you than I am, because we're longtime friends and have known each other, been, been through thick and thin together. It sounds like you're describing um, the step before Jurassic Park happens. That's right. It, it sounds like you're <laughs> describing the moment where people discover something and then they then they need to decide, should we or shouldn't we? And they say, yeah, the heck with it. We should. Let's go do it, because now they have. Yeah, this is Jurassic Dork. This is one step. This is where you're you're just, um, you're, you're, this is what's so cool about this. It's the dumbest idea in the world. You put random information in there, random DNA information. It's like having a blueprint for a house that now you decide we're just going to take a, we're going to, we're going to give a, a chimp a Sharpie marker and have it redesign this little quarter, this little room over here. And, you know, once in a while it turns, it's just absolute garbage and gravel. Another times it's an elaborate tower that does something important for the overall structure. And so this is what, but it's rare that that happens, but because we can work with bacterial colonies or this easy to transform plant in a rabidopsis, it allows us to uh, find that very rare event at some frequency. So you described the uh, experience as a blueprint and saying, you know, we have this little room over here and we let them go scribble on the walls there. That's um, describing something that's really precise. As in, like, we are using CRISPR because we're going to put it in in exactly the right spot or exactly the same spot that we want every time, as opposed to randomly injecting it into the DNA, which is what most of how Roundup Ready and these other types of um, GMOs are created. They, they randomly put them in there, and then when they accidentally fall into the one spot that they need it to be, then they use that one. That's which right. are you doing? Uh, Neither. <laughs> we're actually putting things in random places with no precision, and we're putting in something that we have no idea what it does because it never existed before. I always liken it to standing next to a very elaborate machine with with 100,000 moving parts that all have to work in synchrony, and we're throwing monkey wrenches into it. 
And once in a while, they're going in and bouncing out. Other times they go through and it doesn't matter. That's the majority of the outcomes. But once in a while, it sticks in the gears and grinds the machine to a halt. And so when we start to apply that same technology to Staph aureus, which causes MRSA, or Yersinia pestis, which causes um, the plague, these are difficult to kill bacteria that now we can have a rapid pipeline to develop new chemistries that disrupt their physiology. Whoa. Okay. Well, so in that explanation, what I had missed out on was I thought you were just still living in plant land where the things that Kevin works on are agricultural products. I, I didn't have an understanding that you could apply this out to any pathogen that, that is harming either us or our interests. Yeah, anything that is efficiently transformable. So anything where we can put DNA in at a relatively high frequency is game for this particular assay. And we've made these lot, what we call libraries, which are collections of 800,000 random sequences that we can shove in any population of organisms and then ask what happens. And so anything that is where there's efficiency in getting the genes in is a perfect candidate for this particular approach. How can you possibly do this at scale enough that, that the randomness, I mean, it would sound like you're throwing grains of sand, you know, trying to get it out of the universe or something. Yeah. I don't it, how, how how do you do this at scale? Yeah, that's the big that's a big challenge. And that's been the problem with this project is we haven't been able to convince you know, deep pockets that this is something that is uh, in their in their interest. They all think it's a great idea, but they say, give us a product that we can work with and we'd love to work with you. Is this is this biology's form of like a SETI project? Is this like is it is it that big of wide open space that you're looking to find something? I, I, I don't think so, because the way it's different is that SETI is casting this giant net and looking with high resolution to find so something. So SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. intelligence. And and it's an actual funded project. Like oh, yeah. millions of dollars go into it. People are using radio telescopes. They're using high-end mathematics and computers. It's a legit thing. However, I think most of the world looks at SETI and says, you're searching for something that you'll never find. You're It's it's like looking out, being in Hawaii and hoping in, uh, uh, a coconut comes to you from some other place. Like, yeah. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. No, this is a lot different in that we know that it works and that we're, we're looking at um, biology is a lot easier to disrupt because there's many ways that you can disrupt the way two, two critical proteins interact with each other or the way that a membrane holds together or the way that a certain part of the cell functions, whatever. And we're throwing something in there that biology never intended and evolution never shaped. We're throwing it, um, so evolution always takes these funny steps because of mutations by slightly changing a protein or slightly changing a gene in a way that introduces a slight variant or sometimes a radical variant that changes biology. We're throwing in something that doesn't belong there and showing that it, it can at times integrate with what is there. And sometimes does it in a way that is either helpful or deleterious, but is something that gives us a, another way to manipulate biology. Do you see this long term always being about killing the the thing? Because, I mean, that's actually like you're just trying to say, can we throw in one wrench that knocks the whole plan out? That's why it's valuable for something like MRSA or some other sort of disease or a pathogen like a fungus. You could do that with with like rusts that travel. Do you imagine a, a period in time where this randomness is much more directed and you're instead building from random blocks? Absolutely. Yeah, we can throw a monkey wrench in the machine and it kicks out twice as many widgets. And we've seen that. We we can make things flower earlier. We can change pigmentation. We can get different architecture of plants. So there, it's not strictly a uh, deleterious function, even though that one has great importance. Um, in back to, in future uh, invention of antibiotics as well as herbicides, especially if they have low environmental problems. But dude, okay, so as like you're describing all this, I see your your facial reactions, your eyebrows are raised. You've got this like excitement about this. I think that most people, when they hear that um, somebody is intentionally throwing in genetic wrenches, it's not just like oh hey we're doing work in our laboratory. Now you're getting pretty specific about how. It sounds like you're doing mad scientist stuff. It is. But, <laughs> but no, but what it is, is we're shaking the snow globe of life and watching how the snow falls and learning new ways that we can create 
variation that is desperately needed. We need ways to protect people from bacteria. And, you know, there's antibiotic resistant strains and there's no other way to come up with it. This is a way of being extremely disruptive with a chemistry that never existed that we can learn from and learn how to design the next generation of drugs that may have taken us much longer to do if we didn't have the seed of a guide to help us get there. Are other people doing this sort of uh, random DNA, random chemistry mixture? Uh, No one did it. um, Well, I should say it was done in the 1970s, late 70s, early 80s, to identify ways in which proteins bound other proteins. And it was something uh, called phage. What does that mean? I mean, most people, they don't deal in the world of proteins. Yeah. So let's just say that you were trying to understand. um, They did this a lot with early uh, immunology and other uh, types of processes where you wanted to understand the ways that uh, so proteins are the are the enzymes and the structural components of cells. And so they're they're the functional. They're the things that make things happen. They're the things that make structures. So how do you make. Uh, so proteins function by interacting with each other and interacting with other molecules. And so the question always is, how do these things, uh, how does, what is one protein interacting with another one? They were able to take viruses or bacterial viruses, phages, and give them random information and then test to see where that random information would bind a given protein. This was back in the 70s and early 80s. I know that Fred Perlack did a lot of his microbiology work in phage research. Yes, it was huge for a long time. And so now the question was, so back then people were doing this and someone just got the Nobel Prize for it. It actually came out of Missouri. Um, Now, years later, and I didn't know about this when we came up with this dumb idea. um, We started to do this and then realized, well, back when we were looking to get the uh, process patent protected that anything that was close to prior art was done in phage and so that's where we realized that this had been done you know sort of before but we were really the ones and we're as far as i know we're the only ones who are actively pushing this because we created the library you know we have the pool of of the resource and when you say you created the library it's saying we've are we can show you what we've already tried and that will make it so the guesses that you have will be much tighter? Well, what it means is that we have the 800,000 random DNA sequences that can be introduced into a population of organisms. So we, we made that. And it was, wasn't was trivial. How did you choose those 800 rather than, or did you say 800,000? 800, 800,000. So it wasn't that we chose them. It's that we randomly created them. So trying to make 800,000 independent anything would be very difficult. That's right. And so we did this. And and so that was the feat. You know, how do you ensure that you're getting 800,000 as you continue to amplify it and change it and do all the things we have to do as we make it? And so it's a really important resource. We're very excited to have it. And we're actually crowdsourcing um, other people's resources if they would like to collaborate with us. And so we'll, we can talk about that if you like. So are you very familiar with the iGEM project? Sure. So did you have you ever sent a team out there? No, I never sent a team, but I actually was there last year for the podcast. Um, I did go in maybe 2017. No kidding. Yeah. So for the listeners, uh, iGEM is a project. It stands for International Competition of Genetically Engineered Machines. And they bring in undergrad college students that are like they look like little babies, right? They're just out of high school. They're fresh faced. They are um, excited about science. And instead of saying you can only do these types of science projects, they say you can do something that we consider synthetic biology. Really, it's genetic engineering on a pretty intense scale and come up with a problem that you want to solve and then go solve it. So I I, I was there four years ago and saw some crazy things like these kids figured out um, from China that they could engineer a bacteria to express a property that created a magnetic field. And it was able to pull in um, water molecules that had been polluted by heavy metals and then grab it all into one space and then float to the center of the water mass. And then you would be able to pull it out. So they they had figured out how to use synthetic engineering, synthetic biology 
to be able to solve water pollution. And that's just one of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these examples. Oh, yeah. I saw some kids who they would 3D print a little box that you could then add a very inexpensive reagent to, say, your corn and be able to detect um, aflatoxin or any of these really deadly mycotoxins. And they would distribute these in Africa. So it's funny that you mentioned aflatoxin. Uh, This is a, a bit of a rabbit hole, but I was just recently invited to the South Dakota State University and they they invited me in to to give a talk and I talked about aflatoxin in Africa and how when I was a Peace Corps volunteer I actually was in a situation where the people in that were in the Peace Corps with me in our homestay we thought that the corn um, had aflatoxin in it somebody had somebody's parent had called up and said or sent a, sent a like a CNN article saying aflatoxin has broke out in Kenya. Yeah. So we thought that meant our village. So we thought maybe there was aflatoxin in there. Is it really as deadly as what we were led oh. to believe? It was like, they would say, if you have a microgram, you have a, you, an undetectable amount by the eye, you'll and you eat it you're dead oh it's horrible it, it's it, it is that bad oh, it's an insanely carcinogenic compound it's a, a compound that's created by aspergillus flavus it's a it's a common fungus and this is the kind of fungus that when a crop is damaged it like um, from insect damage can get into corn can get into soy can get into anything and the standards in the industrialized world are so good and we test for it and farmers know how to suppress it no problem. I mean, it's very good here. They will reject entire loads of cr- grain if they detect this stuff above some tiny, tiny level. Food safety is good. In Africa, no. Um, in Africa, uh, when you're storing your grain at home, if it's not sufficiently dry, uh, you will get aflatoxin. So this is what was happening was was there were people, the reason the Peace Corps volunteers freaked out so bad is that they were noticing that at night, people would gather up their grain that they had left outside and started storing it um, in their houses because people were coming by and stealing it. Yeah. And so they were bringing it inside the house where it would be moist or the, the house would capture the heat rising off of the grain and then a fungus would go. That's that's the myth that we were told. And we were scared. No, it's true, though. And, and what, you know, it's so beautiful. I mean, I'll, we'll give that hair, scary story is, though, is that it leads to liver cancer. And when you go to you, know, you were in Africa, I've been to Africa. You don't see a lot of old people walking around. And a lot of that is because of uh, diseases that come from these kinds of mycotoxins from foodborne products. And it's very pervasive. But the beautiful part of this is that people have solved this problem with very simple ways. Uh, There's a guy named Brett Ryerson who works with the World Food Program where he sells a, or sells or gives away, a plastic drum that's hermetically sealed. So it allows an African family to store their grain in that drum, seal it, and then the grain is absorbing oxygen because the, um, you know, respiration, like the little embryo in there is getting work done, and it sucks all the oxygen out so the fungus can't grow. And it's sealed. And it changes the lives of families. Something is simple like that. One woman he worked with um, was growing coffee. And her income changed from being very poor to extremely middle class based upon uh, sealable bags, hermetically sealable bags that would preserve her grain and not allow the fungus to grow. And she, and this just is heart, so heartwarming in a way, but heartbreaking in another. She so, told him, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to be poor again. And he said, well, why? Why would you be poor? She says, my bag broke and doesn't work anymore. She didn't even know that she could get another bag or have it repaired. You know, this bag was her livelihood. It changed her life to be able to hermetically seal to keep aflatoxin wow. out, of, out of coffee. You know, and we think about things so simple as Tupperware, right? Where you just <laughs> throw your stuff in your refrigerator. Uh, the The... It's really jarring when you go to a place like Africa and you see that they don't get to store food for even one additional meal, right? You can't make food at lunch and then eat it again at dinner because the stuff will grow in it. Bacteria, you know, food poisoning can happen in that short of amount of time. Mm -hmm. So you have to spend so many more hours cooking that that whatever time you had left over from actually being out and pulling weeds out of the garden or wandering around with water trying to bring it back to the house so you can boil the grain, the amount of time you spend cooking and making that food is is all of your time. 
Yeah, yeah. The, the, I had to hitchhike a ride back to Entebbe from where I was one time. And the kid who gave me a ride, he's giving me a ride and had to deviate from the route. And I'm like, where are you going? I got to get to the airport. He goes, I have to take the milk home. You know, he had milk for his family and they don't have a refrigerator. You know, he's got to get that home and in his family's home. And, and that was it. So when he starts pulling off the road, did you did you think you were a goner? I um, had a Garmin watch on and I punched it on and I hooked up, connected to the Internet. And I said, here's where I am right now. I turned on my GPS <laughs> because I didn't. I mean, it was kind of weird. No, I've and, been there before. I, there was a time when I was in uh, Balboa. I was in Panama City. And uh, we were with a cab driver and I knew the way from where we were, the bar to the ship. And he took a left hand turn before we got to the yards. And I was like, OK, you got to be ready to jump out of this car because he is taking you somewhere where you don't want to go. It turns out the port had had one of the gates turned, you know, shut down for that night. And so he was going to another gate. He just knew more about the situation than I did. But that feeling that you have. When you're in a foreign place and somebody takes a turn that you aren't expecting, that's scary. Oh, yeah. And I had 3200 bucks in my pocket. US, oh, man. And I had an iPhone on me. That'd be more money than he's. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Than most of the people I've ever seen. That's three middle class incomes for for three families. And um, and uh, he took me through some places that were just mobbed with people. And he said, put your phone down because, uh, you know, you don't want to have it. Someone will take it. And I did. But we kept driving and we weren't on the main road. And, you know, it was it was getting a little funky. Um, but, you know, it was what it was. And, you know, but those are those are the kinds of things that make memories, I guess. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it's those adventures where you figure out, like, did I push it too far? Because you can. Right. You go on an adventure and you think, hey, this is this is great. I figured out how to live and survive in this new place. Look at me. I'm hitchhiking or I'm taking a cab. And then something goes sideways and you think, was I Icarus? You know, did I go, <laughs> did I go too far? Yeah, but I guess that, but that was the funny part is that that particular adventure was a kind of the cherry on the Sunday. <laughs> of all the craziness? Uh, no, there was, well, there was uh, that whole, tr- that whole trip we broke down somewhere and I had to be in Washington DC the next day. What were you doing there? Who, uh, who brought I, you there? I was there for a conference. And then after the conference was over, I went with a friend and we, you were in Africa for a conference. Yeah, it was a high level bio safety conference where we were speaking with the um, minister of science technology. They called him science, science and technology minister. Um, he was going to the parliament to try to get approval for a mechanism to deregulate the bacterial wilt resistant banana and the high beta carotene, the, the vitamin A banana, because these are finished products behind a barbed wire fence. So these are products that are could be grown in in which country was this? In Uganda. In Uganda, and they're not being grown. And the vitamin A, what what kind of a difference would that make to people living in Africa? Oh, tremendous, tremendous. I mean, just something so small as bananas with vitamin A so, make a big difference. So well, well, matoke bananas are a part of every meal. And it's a starchy banana. You use it like, like, uh, like rice. Like a, yeah, it's more yeah. like a sweet potato kind of. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of the, the basis of the meal. And uh, there's a huge problem with vitamin A deficiency and blindness, followed by other immune problems and physiological problems. You know that lead to early death, and it's endemic all over the world. But in the Lakes region of Africa, is particularly bad. And African scientists, um, and University of Queensland scientists came up with a banana. Their local You know, the one that they want, the one that people consume, only it makes beta carotene, the orange stuff in carrots. And when you consume that, it turns to vitamin A and alleviates the blindness. This exists in their research park. Looks great, grows great, but you can't have it outside of that park because there's no rules to deregulate it. And I was there to try to talk to the, uh, to help the science and technology minister talk to parliament to get it that in place and i left on september 29th and october 4th i got the text message that it was approved hey well yeah i cried for a while i really was i was so happy um but then the president overturned it (laughs) oh so i mean it's i mean i i laugh because it's such a horrible situation here's something that can save hundreds of thousands of lives tens of thousands of lives locally and um it exists 
It's like having a medicine that could solve kids from dying and they don't distribute it. It's behind a barbed wire fence. Yeah, but so, but let's be candid though. Like, is this that they're going to have to eat 300 Matoke bananas for the rest of their lives? Like, how much vitamin A is actually there? How much of it can be absorbed? This, yeah. like, as you're presenting it, this is actually going to solve it or is it just like, one of the compliments to help sign it. No, I believe that it does. Um, the num- the numbers are sufficient in the amount that they eat. And, you know, to be honest, I don't need something to be 100% effective for everybody in order to make it very useful. If it helps a child stay above the threshold most of the time so that their health and vision deteriorate slowly or, you know, less Im- rapidly or, you know, if it gives somebody something, um, you know, it's worth doing. I, so, so I often, you and I have talked about this before, the concept of a steel man, where you take the other side's argument and instead of making it weak or making a caricature of it, you actually give a good description of what it is that they think um, so that the person that you're talking with that believes that actually agrees with you and says, yes, I, yeah, that's right. That's how I would say it too. So what do you think is a steel man argument that the president of of uganda would have the, the of why not to approve it yeah i i what he said is that and what you hear from a lot of people there is that if it's not good enough for the eu and the usa then it's not good enough for us and i understand his argument because they were under repressive colonialism and they had you know and this is something in everybody's mind and they don't and when they see the industrialized world turning their nose up at uh, at technology, they somehow feel, well, maybe the things that we hear are true, that this is poison and that they're just going to foist it upon a developing nation, you know, to use us for our resources or whatever, you know, that. And so those are the arguments that you hear. And that, so to, to your point, and I think this goes on in the United States about us thinking about another culture. But when I was living in Kenya and I was doing condom demonstrations, I could go to a church the next day and the and the preacher would be up at the front of the room saying, don't use condoms because the liquid inside of them is designed to give you HIV and AIDS. Those that came from people that use condoms and they don't know any different, but they open up a condom and it looks like that and they've had bad experiences or they've been told that the reason that they're in dire poverty is because of the Americans or the the Kaburu, the British. So I can see yeah. that if you were the president of a country that thought that, even if you yourself did not believe that, if you thought that your people believe that, maybe you wouldn't maybe you wouldn't approve it either. And that's what's so sad about this. It's scientists from there that have created these solutions. You know, it's not the big American companies or anything like that. And that's Oh, you weren't going over there to like represent Florida's no you, no no I, I, I was, they, they invented this they invented this and the the uh, science and technology minister so I gave I went there and gave a talk about communication and how you roll out technology and how we discuss technology with people and that was an important step um, very counter to the way that most people there were discussing science which is much the way we did it here it was very heavy-handed data driven rather than connecting through values and feelings and that was a big step. But the minister was still the science minister. He's a physician was still citing the Seralini paper, the one with the lumpy rats that ate the GMO corn that has since been shown to be total garbage. He you know, he's getting asked questions about that from Parliament, who still sees that paper as a roadblock to why this technology should not be deployed. And he had to be able to answer that with a uh, correct scientific resolution. So you talked about the uh, rats, the lumpy rats, and you said that's garbage. And I know that that's garbage in the sense that I've heard that rats that were used in the study are more likely to get tumors. And the only way that you could get tumors that size would be to allow those rats to have lived in really horrible conditions, way beyond whatever you would medically need. So they were actually stretching to be able to make this look bad. But that's only one side. Does the does does Cyrilini believe that he hijacked that study 
I mean, is there a way that he could have conducted that study to receive those results and they're just an anomaly? Well, I guess the uh, the good answer to that is that it's been repeated four times since, only with more animals and better uh, protocols. And it was 15 million euros that have been spent trying to replicate the data that he claims back in 2012. And in the, what, now seven years ensuing, no one has come close to reproducing those data. Now, the original data came from a type of rat, which by two years, which was this time point, 77% of those rats presented with those tumors. If you look at the table, table two, the control rats also had the tumors. And so when you, and this is the way that I look at that paper, I only have to say two things, three things. There's that figure with those three lumpy rats. It was GMOs, GM, Roundup in the water, or GMOs in Roundup. Where's the rat that didn't get a treatment? They couldn't show that rat because it had tumors too. And if they showed that rat, that figure doesn't have any impact. The other thing that's bad is that on the panels of the figure, it didn't say transgenic construct, you know, Mon 801 or whatever it was. It said GMO. Scientists don't use that term. That was put there to link that term with that lumpy rat. The third leg of that stool is they let those rats suffer past when they should have been normally euthanized. If my laboratory had rats or any laboratory, any laboratory in the States or in my university, let animals go to that point with those tumors, we would be shut down forever, period. You don't do that. So here they were letting animals suffer to the point where they could stick them next to that three letters GMO and leave off the control. And it achieved exactly what they wanted. It shut down progression of this technology. It scared a generation. And it changed policy in places like Uganda to stop technology from helping people it could help. So in your opinion, though, that that means that somebody had an agenda, an intention. And uh, why why would somebody have the intention of of creating that much fear in the in the environment I mean, i can't second guess someone else's intentions to be honest and i i would be wrong to go there but i can say it's part of a history where he has uh, where that group has published for many years now uh, experiments in a petri dish where they would um say you know we look at testosterone levels in lydig cells so cells from testicles they would say um that when we put incubate them with roundup herbicide that they don't make testosterone as much. And then you would look at the data and it would be like only the lowest concentration had a little bit of an effect. (laughs) High concentrations didn't matter. But the entire setup of the paper was um, fertility rates are going down around the world, as is increasing in the amount of herbicide. Maybe there's something to do with the two. So they would create a story and then find some weird data point to support it and then count on the insane internet to spread it and propagate it. And it does. It works like a charm. So that that whole group, they've been mostly labeled as irrelevant now because they none of their work can be repeated. It's been shown that it harmed many people indirectly. They've got as big as a body count as Wakefield, if not more. And what do you mean by that? Well, meaning that the bad science that Wakefield published results in now measles cases and all this anti-vax movement. Seralini is the Wakefield of the genetic engineering um, world and that he's the figurehead that they hold up as the, um, you know, maligned savior who told the truth that, um, you know, the big bad companies want to shut down. And so he still has a tremendous following. He's got a very strong presence online, is looked at very favorable, speaks at conferences, and yet nobody can repeat his data and nobody um, and and what he has published is largely considered was large when it came out most of us looked at it as though it was highly suspect and so there are heads of technology and science of entire countries that are citing this guy's research kenya shut down genetic engineering um, approvals upon publication of that paper and this was at a time when they could use the corn, they could use uh, BT resistance in cotton, they could use or insect resistance in cotton, they could use a lot of virus resistance. Fall armyworm looks like it's going to be a formidable um, problem in Kenya. Um, they need technology to be present on the table and at least deployable. And this arrested it, finally being lifted. 
the the uh, fall army worm that you mentioned is an interesting concept because most people they have no interaction at all with insects in their food, right? Like the most that we deal with with insects, if you're living in suburban America, is you have mosquitoes um, or the black gnats or some ladybugs around your house that you don't really want. But that's about it. Um, But when you're talking about food, now you've got a whole different thing going on there because it's not like they can say, oh, there's a worm in here. I don't want to eat it. They don't want to eat it, but they don't have that many options. (laughs) And, and I, I think that when you start talking about an infestation of worms, you're talking about a situation where they could eat the entire field and have just the scraps left over for any human beings that were around there. And what are their options right now if they were going to try and stop it without genetic engineering? Yeah, right now you got old school pesticides that sometimes are, you know, organophosphates and carbamates, things that we use here very, very limitedly and things that have been banned from other places in the world. These are the old school um pesticides of the uh, 70s and 80s, 60s, the neurotoxins, you know, the, the, the organophosphates. Um, this is what they have. And this is what they use on uh, to combat fall armyworm. Fall armyworm, this, like you say, it's not getting a worm in the apple. This is going to bed at night and waking up the next day and your crops are gone. These things, it's that fast. These things are like a blanket on the field when they come. And the fall armyworm spins a little web and gets caught on wind currents and can travel 60 kilometers, set down somewhere else and start another colony. This thing is a formidable opponent, and we need to be meeting this with every bit of technology we can throw at it, especially on the African continent, and uh, and, and not just not just genetic engineering, but you know gene drives and everything else we can do. Um, all every trick in the book needs to be deployable, and now you've got governments. So gene drive. Let's wait. Well, just, you know. The, so gene drive is when you make a change to the dna of an an insect or a mammal or something and then you put it back into the wild knowing that it will propagate knowing that that dna change that you've made is going into the wild and once you put it out there you can't pull it back is that is that an accurate description of gene drive yes and that's why it works is because it goes out and replicates faster than other um the alleles or other sure but i wasn't going to let you just like slot that one into the into the game without people understanding what you're proposing and and, and of course there are many many scientific evaluations and societal social evaluations that need to be done too and we've talked about this quite a bit in different contexts but the idea is is that that needs to be on the table we can't categorically dismiss anything including pesticides uh organophosphates maybe there's places where they do have to be used safely and reasonably and away from populations where they could affect people um we have to have every tool on the table if we're going to take on some of these tremendous challenges we we can't do it with the old school tools is starvation as far as you could tell a real problem still in africa it's something that i think in pockets there have been discussions of the word famine again um because of fall army worm others would decline to say that that's true that there's ways we can get aid to people now that are unprecedented it is striking to me that that now as an adult i mean because i can remember as a kid dan rather coming on and talking about what was going on in somalia the extreme famine Ethiopia, ethiopia i remember as a kid and even when i was in kenya what i began to realize there was for them to hit a famine is hard it's not impossible but it's it's hard but what they have is a serious lack of um nutrition that that you know they love ugali i've talked about that with another guest where it's like this grain with uh, ground corn with oil and water um and and it's just a really basic starch but there are people that that's all they eat you know like so or maybe a little bit of oil and a little bit of fruit but that's it so they're able to survive but they definitely don't have the optimal, you know, conditions to, under which humans thrive. That's oh, very true. And, and, and I think you see that more and more, um, that there are a lot of examples where we tend to, our world's food staples are rice, potatoes, cassava, um, um, you know, um, other corn, th- wheat, things that don't have a lot of nutrition other than carbohydrate. Right. And so where do you get the micronutrients? Uh, you can attribute so much death and malnutrition to iron, zinc, and vitamin A. 
And those are things where a grain of sand of zinc or a, a grain of sand of iron, a grain of sand of vitamin A separate life for death for six months for people. I Is mean, that right? Like that small amounts, amount. Tiny, tiny amounts. So uh, to be totally honest, I mean, I wasn't pulling your leg about the vitamin A bananas. I've always been a little bit suspicious of that because it seems like how low could they be on vitamin A and how much could you actually get to them from a banana? You're saying it's legit. No, it's, there's, it, it's, it is. So here's the real answer. Nobody has ever done the experiment. You can't give a bunch of, of the vitamin A banana to people and then measure soluble or beta carotene bananas and then measure soluble vitamin A in the blood. Um, it can't be done ethically. Um, it hasn't been Wait, done. wait, what do you mean? Because, I mean, that's, because, this is the same thing. Okay, and Fred and I have talked about this before, but this is a, a great conversation to have. People say there's no GMO studies on human beings. You're saying we can't go test the bananas on these people. We're saying it will help them. Why not? What is the eth- what is the possible explanation you can have that we can't test this on humans? Well, there's a couple of levels on this because you can imagine the PR that well, I don't want to say PR, the noise that would happen around this with there you go testing this on Africans. Yeah, there but we go. test. Uh, uh, you know. Sure, but drugs actually do get tested that way. Vaccines yes. actually do get tested that because way because drugs and vaccines are are things that we know have a discrete toxicity. We know they have a discrete um, mechanism of action. We know how they affect human physiology. We can look at that and monitor that. And so when we're doing clinical trials, that's because we know so much about how it works and what we would expect, and can look for collateral effects. This is taking something and saying, let's just give it to people and see what happens. And that's not science. What what we did do and what has been proposed is to test those bananas here in uh, Iowa State University. And they had somebody here. They were going to pay students like $900. I remember that yeah. kid wore that stupid banana suit from... Uh, yeah, what a dork. Yeah. Yeah, but they were going to eat um, uh, bananas and get like 900 bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they would measure the vitamin a levels right and those experiments got shut down they did yeah and was that that banana guy that's what that's from that guy wearing the banana around and handing out pamphlets and things like that yeah the the woman who was going to do those experiments she's a chemist who looks at levels of the carotenoids in the blood she doesn't care one way or the other about matoki bananas uganda um gmos she measures the levels in the blood and the fact that she was going to do this she got death threats because she was going to be the person analyzing the blood in the What experiment. is going on? Who is it that is so inflamed that they would threaten a a professor at a university that's doing a test that seems as innocuous as that? Well, you know, it, is it because they don't want it released? It's it's because they're people who are against technology. Because if you save one kid with a vitamin A banana, then the whole other fear of genetic engineering goes out the window. Right. Like if you say if you show that these kids that you gave them this this plant product and now their vitamin A levels are high and now they can go to school and now they're surviving and now their level of uh, vitamin A immune deficiency and diarrheal diseases goes down. Now, people don't fear Roundup Ready corn. You think the whole stakes come down to, to the, you, you think they're like you've got to win on this front. Otherwise, we lose all the rest of the game. 100 percent. I think it's the first domino. And I think that's why they downplay the the impacts of the BT brinjal in Bangladesh, which are irrefutable that the, there's an eggplant that protects itself from insects and using BT, just using, like the cotton just that, like the that cotton Fred Perlack Fred per- talked to. Exactly. You. And um, once that shows to have efficacy, it now changes the whole conversation. Why aren't we doing more of this? And so I think it's important to shut that down. What else could we be doing if we weren't doing vitamin A bananas? Uh, vitamin A, zinc, high zinc, high um, uh, iron. They're doing this with traditional breeding the long way. Um, vitamin A, they've done it to sweet potato. The African sweet potato is white. Mm-hmm. And the uh, orange flesh sweet potato that we have is very sweet, but theirs is very starchy and white. Um, they had to breed the orange into it. Be, rather than just add the gene in a lab. And it took decades to do it. Really? 
Yeah, but they because did. they were trying, they would just keep trying to create hybrids that would one of them would have the orange color or. Well, it's it's you have to get all the traits in one place, right? And you have to get resistance to the insects, resistance to um, you know a disease. You have to get uh, keep all of the susceptibility of a Western sweet potato where you have plenty of protection for it with chemistry, uh, uh, where it has to grow in the African continent, which then again has diverse soils and um, geography from top to east, from north to south, east to west. Yeah. That's that's right. So it's, you know, it, you had to come up with, you had to s- solve on many fronts um, this orange flesh sweet potato. And they did this. They have um, different breeders all throughout the continent. They're working on it. Won the um, World Food Prize in 2016. But the kids, the other cool part about this is, is that it wasn't just enough to give people an orange potato and say, here you go. It's all better that you have to change the mindset of the consumer. They're no different than us in that regard, that when you're used to eating a white flesh sweet potato your whole life, now you've got this orange thing. And men, as I understand it, are they don't want to eat orange things that are sweet. Huh. And there's even places where they say, well, it'll make you impotent or make you, you know, I would say a lot of things about that. That's, And um, so men stay away from them. So they start with the children. And the children start their day in a lot of parts of Africa saying, uh, they, they, I saw these videos. These kids are adorable. They're banging on the table saying this chant of, if I eat the orange potato, I'll be strong. If I eat the orange potato, I'll be, um, I'll be smart. I eat the orange potato. And then in all the soccer fields and everywhere, it's all cartoons of orange sweet potatoes. It's interesting and, to hear you say this, right? Because that's straight up pop propaganda, right? Right, it is. It's it straight up propaganda. But, but, but it's, it's not propaganda. But it's on it's, the good guy's it, side. Well, no, because propaganda has, is based on intent, right? And, and this is information using the same tools of propaganda, but for not for malevolent reasons or to manipulate people. This is to get to raise awareness, which, you know, what's the difference, I guess. But this is to aware, raise awareness for these kids. And you know what the most cool thing is, is that when they did this, you could go into these places and draw their blood and you see the increased vitamin A. So it does work. And, um, and, and, and that just makes me so happy. Yeah. It's it's an interesting, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of pulling your leg about the propaganda side. But I mean, I do believe it in, in a way. Like I remember when I would see HIV AIDS uh, commercials on television. And although I was on the same side as, hey, I want I want you to know that because I was in there as a Peace Corps volunteer. Part of my work was. HIV and AIDS um, prevention, and the other part was malaria prevention. And when I first got there, I, we did a lot more um, HIV AIDS. And I remember seeing the commercials and being like, "Yeah, th- those are the good guys." And then you'd see that there the some of the fear tactics that they would use, and you're like, "Ah, that's kind of scary." But I'm glad they're doing it because they're right. But you gotta have a you got to you got to at least say how do i feel about you have to at least think about the fact that you're using propaganda well but it's it's what it is is you and i and you and i know this right how do you change the way people feel about something how do you change someone's opinion or they have get, to have a new story yeah, and the it, story has to be better than the last one and how do you get people to take action they have to have some sort of impetus to do that and we can appeal to intellect sometimes but Sometimes you got to go for the emotional center of the brain. And that's what we've been failing on as scientists for so long when we communicate these things. We're trying to make uh, high level executive function connections with people we're trying to convince. And really what we need to be doing is telling those more emotional stories, talking about the kids that can benefit from these technologies. You know, we, we went about it all wrong. You can give you more facts and figures and change your mind. But, you know, as Maya Angelou, who said, uh, people forget what you say and they forget what, what you told them, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Yeah. And I believe that. I mean, that is the most important part of science communication is how do I leave these people feeling different than when we came in? And sometimes that takes emotional tools and it takes um, getting them to convince that our ethics are in line and our values are on the same page. So you and I have both uh, heard it said and probably said it ourselves quite a few times of either farmers or scientists, you need to get out and tell your story, tell your story. Um, What do you think has gotten better about what farmers and scientists have done over the last few years? And where do you think there still needs to be work? Well, I love the fact that so many good ones have gotten into this and done it better than I could have 
ever believed. And I'm so excited to see people getting traction in those areas that are telling the story effectively. And, you know, just, I mean, I could throw so many names around. I mean, I, I should actually, but, you know, uh, but people like um, Leslie Kelly, who does high high heels and canola fields. Does, That's right. Yeah, I, with Rob Sharkey. I love her blog lately. And Rob Sharkey is another good one. Um, you look at people like Leah McGrath, who tell great stories for dietitians. Um, Marcel Cardell at my university has a great Twitter feed. These are all scientists and others who are starting to engage in those areas from stories and their experiences and how they're meeting people and creating the change they need to see is by creating those good connections and uh, showing those realities. And Leslie popped into my head because she's done such a great job just over the last few weeks um, up in Alberta. They've had horrible weather that really threw a monkey wrench into their harvest plans. And when she shares this, that's a story that never got out there or never got out there <laughs> before you didn't have uh, people showing that, you know, here's a farmer farmer that they lose X amount of crop because of a freak snowfall. And this changes the life for a family for a year, you know? And, the, and uh, I think you see when you make those human connections, it changes the way people feel about it. Yeah. I mean, I, so there's a guy that both of us know, Brian Scott, the farmer's life yeah. actually he yeah. sent me a hat. Yeah, but, cool. um, yeah, and, you see the power that it has for a farmer that's growing popcorn, regular corn and soybeans to have a video of his son turning a combine around or pushing the buttons to to uh, let go the grain. And I mean, there, you just see him interacting in a way. And then people can't say anymore. I don't know a farmer or I've never I, I, I wouldn't know what they do because he's there all the time. He's showing this is what's going on at the harvest. We had a we had a fire in the combine. Yep. And uh, what, at what where, where do you see this having made an impact? I think it does because people finally are starting to connect with the idea that somebody there's a person on the other end of that food supply it's not just coming from your grocery store that there are families who have consequences because of weather because of policy um, when we have soybean tariffs how that shifted things for soybean growers who talked about this publicly um, how um, most of all like things that uh, like Brian's a great example you know you take a picture of a sunset in a hubcap and that gets you know so many hundreds of thousands of downloads it reminds people that um, that this is there and this is happening farmers have been too there's not many of them by pop, you know, relatively by population. And the ones that are there have been silent and kept to themselves, either because they feel they don't want to brag about their operation or that it's nobody's business, right? Well, I mean, I think it's a selection pressure in a lot of ways, right? The type of person that's going to go live out on the panhandle of Oklahoma yeah. or in the middle of Iowa or Nebraska, they don't really want to be out there talking to a lot of people necessarily. That's right. And same with scientists. I mean, we've, we've selected a, an elite group of people who are good at sitting in front of a computer and uh, writing papers and grants, right? Same kind of thing. And so it's, it's really what has changed is that now we see the people who are willing to engage engaging and being welcomed into the conversation. And the science geeks who are out there love to see what's happening on the farm. They love to see what's happening in the lab. They love to see a scientist synthesis of something or a farmer's opinion on something. And just having those personal contacts uh, because of the um, conduit of the internet and the power that brings allows those relationships to happen. So, but speaking of those relationships, when I was working at Monsanto, uh, you know this as well as anybody would out there, a lot of my work was saying, we wanna find different tribes the farmer tribes, the science tribes, the skeptics tribes. Let's find these groups. And what let's do is let's introduce them to each other. So that way, if Brian Scott is putting something out, then the skeptic Miles Powers hears about it and says, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I should have him on my podcast. Or he did it, he, he did that with Rob mm-hmm. Sharkey. Um, and then, hey, the skeptics, we want to connect them with some of the scientists. So, so you were on Miles Powers show, right? So you can see that these are getting interconnected. But the, the challenge with interconnecting these groups and having the farmer show off his life is that you have one domain on which you want to be connected with that other person. And the, all the other domains that make you a tribe, so the books that you like to read, the sports that you care about, your political beliefs, which is a huge component of it, 
when all of a sudden those were not congruent, like when Donald Trump was elected, I think a lot of people watched friend groups break up, but my Twitter was like um, Armageddon. It, it was like people being so ruthless and brutal to one another because they both had political opinions. And now when Trump got into office, there were a whole bunch of people in the scientific community that were connected with farmers now had their political opinions come into disagreement with what the farmers thought. Do you think that, that you can make these artificial tribes come together or will the politics that people have drive them too far apart? Yeah, that's a tough question. But I think the way that I look at it is that I don't know the circumstances that the farmers are in. And if I was in their shoes, in their boots, and I was seeing the regulatory pressures and the things that were making my costs go up and the the thing, the policies I thought were unfair and restrictive, then maybe I would feel a little different about political issues, too. None of us agree 100 percent. Well, there are a few uh, who fit into an R or a D camp 100 percent. Right. And that you yeah, most interesting people, it, all of their beliefs don't line up neatly on either the blue team or the red team. Right. right, right. They, they, there's some if there's not some crossover, if if um, between the, the blue team, the red team, the green team and whatever the other teams are, right? Like if there's no crossover, then all you are is ideologically possessed. And that's not interesting. That's boring. Right. And then, but that's, but that's also when we look at the, how we communicate across political divides is we have to align ourselves on the priorities that we share. And um, I think that as an agricultural scientist or a scientist who, who has a facet in agriculture and a very strong desire to help agriculture, you know, I want to do what I can for farmers. I put aside political thoughts and I say, how can I help you be effective in what you do on the farm? But um, what I do, how can I help you share your story? How can I help you uh, better amplify what you need amplified? Um, how, and, and that has nothing to do with politics. I need to help them. And I like to think that when I do that, maybe we build a bridge there that helps build a little trust so that when we want to talk about an issue of, you know, I've had people say to me, Doc, you know, what is up with this global warming thing? You know, we start to make inroads into some of these other politically contentious areas because we establish a, a foundation of trust that show that transcends that. Yeah, I 100 percent agree with that, that that nobody's going to listen to you if the first way that you encounter them uh, is you them you telling them what they've done that's wrong, right? Like the, the humility is what allows you to go into a community. It's what allows you to hitchhike with a guy or meet somebody when you're out on a ship or, you know, humility is what lets you come into a group and say, there's a lot here I don't know. And even though it might strike me as something I don't agree with, the, like I'm going to, I'm going to be comfortable just, just being humble and saying, I don't really know where they're coming from on that. And that's on all sides. Oh, well, and that's a very powerful thing. And most of us don't get this because everybody wants to go into a conversation and be right. And I think it was sometime after my, you know, doctorate training, I, you know, I don't think that's right. I, I just, I, I, I'll, go ahead. I'll, I think that a lot of times people put things out there because they want to get along with other people and they, and the more emotional their answer is, is really just showing, I really, really want to be a part of this group. Because there's so few things, when I look at what people are upset about in politics, that the person, I think, could get themselves that worked up about that specific issue. Maybe that's just me. But my sense is what they're actually saying is, hey, tribe of people that I want to get along with, look how hard I'm willing to work to be a part of your group. Hmm. That's, that's an interesting thought. Yeah. I, I know that when I go into those conversations, I always kind of go in and say, you know, help me understand why you feel that way and help me um, or, or, you know, I go I really do go into these things very humbly saying I don't know. And and I like that even in scientific conversations where I'm an expert is, you know, help me understand how you feel differently about this. And that took a long time to be able to do that. You know, I've been playing around with this idea of, um, you know, I, I so I did this project this year. I wanted to run 500 miles. And at, at first I, I decided I hate every minute of this. And then you get to a point where you're like, wait a second. The more that I hate this, the more it's punishment for me. So finding a way to embrace this or like this 
you know, all of a sudden takes it from being a punishment to being something that I want to do. And the only difference between those two things is my perception of it. And I think that that's um, an ability to uh, embrace the suck. I don't really have a better, I don't, I don't have a better way to put it. Right. Like, but the, I think that's maybe a David Goggins line, but that's like a, the more that you say, I want to be here, you know, if you're lifting weights and you're like, ah, this burns and that feels great. That's the only reason I'm here. That takes you so much further yes. than, and, and I think this applies to communications because I think there's too many people that they start a conversation and they think I'm going to do the toughest thing that I can, which is disagree with this person. As opposed to the toughest thing that I can do here is engage in the conversation and also put my ego down thinking that I'm just sitting here smirking, waiting till they get done saying their dumb thing. And instead, listen to the other person as though they have something to teach you. Yes, because sometimes, well, almost always they do. And even if it helps you better shape your argument. You know, there's a lot of good things that happen when you start to listen to other people like critically. And it took a long time for me to get that because as a scientist, we're taught uh, we, we do everything. We're listening to poke holes in an argument. Right. right? And I'm an old debater. I was a debater, you know, or did that kind of stuff in college. How do we uh, listen to poke holes in someone else's argument rather than listening to understand and understand, understand their basis for their argument and understand the circumstances that brought them there? That's right. And if I take the time to understand that now, that gives me a better basis to persuade them of what I know and what I, and what I feel. And as long as you are, because this is just like jujitsu, right? This is just like you show up and the other person is going to try and choke you. You're going to try and choke them. One of you is going to win, but both of you, actually, the person that lost gets to learn the most. And so you have to remember if I win every time then I am nowhere where I'm learning anything. I'm just sitting here, you know, dominating the other person. But, you know, you need to have an iron that is equally as strong as you. So I think that that's one of those things people want to be like, I cannot possibly understand the other side's position. Well, that's the the, (laughs) game over. Yeah, game over. Yeah, no, that's it's like having a black belt in debate. You know, you're it's it's having the capacity to be able to listen, to understand and then be able to present with respect. And the beauty of that is that that's how we actually are changing hearts and minds. It took a long time to get here. And I think that and I'm saying we I think the larger scientific enterprise as well as uh, ag, ag producers and industry. Why do you view ag as a as a we to you? The, you know, you said I really care about agriculture. What What is it for you that made it? be something that you feel connected to well um, as a land-grant scientist you know i work at university of florida that's a land-grant school and our mission is to serve farmers and the communities and students you know it's a it's a it's a multifaceted issue um with an extension appointment you know and, and for me let me go back to when i first was hired i was hired to work on strawberries with no background in strawberries and I worked on Arabidopsis, that funny model plant, the white lab rat of the plant world. And the legislature created the position. And there was nobody who worked in strawberry genomics because genomics was a brand new field. But they had the wisdom to create that position, knowing that it would be important for the industry. So I, I got hired into the position. And I was told by the industry. Is that common that somebody that does Arabidopsis would be thrown into a whole different crop? No, but that's why they had took so many failed searches. Um, they had to find the right weirdo who wasn't afraid of trying something completely different. And that was me. <laughs> you. Yeah. And um, what was so cool about that was I had to, they asked me to give a talk and they were going to fund my research at $1,800. 1800 that's it just $1,800 to get my research going and they said you got to come down here and tell us what you're going to do for us and so I drove down to Plant City and I was thinking for days how do I and that's the center of the strawberry universe in Florida and I was thinking about how I was going to um, uh, present you know I'm going to tell you about all the problems of modern strawberries in Florida uh, which is total BS Um, so I went down there and said I brought a folding chair and I put it on the ta- on the stage and I said, um, you asked me to give a presentation and I may have an answer, but I don't know the questions. And I said, I'm here to listen. I'm here to try to understand what the problems are before I can try to help help with them. But I'm on your team and I'm willing to do what I can to solve it. And I really won 
the hearts of that industry that day because I wasn't another egghead coming down from the you know main school campus to tell them what they were doing wrong. I was there to understand what their problems were before I tried to insert my, my solutions. And that created a very complimentary dovetailed program that has been very successful now for almost 20 years. And you said that you're going to Mizzou to talk a little bit about what you learned in strawberries. You told me a fact one time that I tell everybody, so I hope I got it right. So I'm going to repeat it to you and you can tell me if I got it, which is that if you're going to have, if you're going to go buy strawberries, you don't want to buy the big, huge, monstrous ones because the the ones that are smaller have the same amount of dissolved sugars in them and that you'll have a sweeter berry per bite if you choose the smaller berries. Did I get that right? That's right. No, the big berry is just more water. And it's the same amount generally of dissolved sugars and volatiles, the things that give it very dis- uh, distinctive character notes, uh, notes of it's aroma notes um, that comes from the volatiles and they're the same in a small or a large berry. It just expands more. Where did strawberries come from? Yeah. Interesting. They originated center of origin is in China, but the um, have radiated since to all over the Northern hemisphere and also Chile. And what's really interesting about this is that strawberries exist at different levels of what we call ploidy, different chromosome numbers. Uh, you and I are diploid. We got a set of chromosomes from mom set from dad. Strawberries diploid. But there's also tetraploids, so two sets from mom, two sets from dad. The modern commercial strawberry is octoploid, so it's got four sets of chromosomes from mom, four sets of chromosomes from dad, and the chromosomes that are in there come from different grandparents. And so it's a total mess in there. What makes it even weirder is that one parent of strawberry came from North America, it was brought back from the colonists to uh, um, Europe in the 15, 1600s. And then in uh, 1712, a Spanish, um, he actually was a, a spy who was in, a, uh, no, French spy, who was looking at uh, Spanish um, fortifications in Chile. He met the, what they call the Marpuche people, or people, indigenous people, who were growing strawberries there. And they were much bigger than the European ones, these little tiny, you know, gross things. So he brought some back. And there they sat from 1712 in the botanical garden at Versailles, those and the other ones next to each other, both making inferior berries. And then in 1860s, a guy named um, Antoine Duchesne comes along. He was a teenager whose dad worked in the botanical garden who started drawing pictures of plants. And he started to look at all the different strawberries. And he realized that when these two crossed, they made a much better berry. And that is the modern strawberry. It came from a chance hybridization of a North American strawberry and a South American strawberry that got together in a European botanical garden. Duchesne presented these to the king. And these were new berries that never existed before in the world. So we're eating an elaborate hybrid with North and South lineage that um, has only been around for a few hundred years. Were people eating those berries before? Or they oh, sure. Were, and so the old the old fashioned, when there were two different lines, those were edible berries, but they came together to form a hybrid that's totally different than the two berries yes, themselves. They were, they were small fruited or sometimes um, not as productive. And when you put the two together, you captured all of this hybrid vigor. You know, they made the mutt of the plant world between the north and the south that just made this outstanding berry. You know, the the story of hybridization uh, reminds me of how I heard that they they taught farmers throughout the United States about hybrid corn. So it used to be that you would take not hybrid corn and it would be not. Well, you maybe know the story. What what would corn have been like before you have hybrids? Well, you had uh, land races and you had um, what's a land race? Well, land races are the are the types of genetics that small populations would maintain. And so they would have something that was superior for their purposes. Uh, Farmers. So like potatoes in a certain mountain in, in Peru might be this kind of land race because they raised it over and over and over again and it's its own breed but it's it's very specific yeah and and so what you had happening in the corn industry before hybridization was different sets of farmers and different seed companies having open pollinated corn seed it just would mix genetically within itself and so you never got a lot of um, really good characters, but you also um, you didn't have a lot of predictability. You got a little better every every generation sometimes because it did homogenize a little bit. But you had these uh, open pollinated varieties is what they called them. And only after the 1920s, when these uh, open pollinated ones started to be deliberately crossed, 
did you see the magic that happened of hybrid vigor where now you had hybrids that didn't that you had two parents that were very different that now when you put them together gave you an individual that was completely different and you could predict if you tried enough you knew hey as long as we cross this mom line with this dad line we get the we get the hybrid vigor well the genetics of that are interesting so what you would do is create two inbreds you would inbreed something over and over and over again so that it was as genetically uniform as it would be. And maybe you had a squatty little plant that made a horrible little ear that was completely resistant to disease. And then you had another one that made so-so ear that was a little bit taller that um, maybe was a little stronger plant. And you had those two plants that individually were completely inferior but genetically very uniform. Now when you mix them together, you create a hybrid that just has outstanding characteristics. And that hybrid, now if that thing crosses with itself, gives you some that look like one parent, some that look like another parent, and everything in between. Yeah, my favorite uh, metaphor for this is like you can't take a Labradoodle and breed it with another Labradoodle and expect that you're going to get a super Labradoodle. You you get some little ones, some big ones. Yeah, you get Labras and Doodles and, yeah. and everything in between, right? Right. But that was why the hybrid corn industry launched was because now the companies that own the seed, own those inbreds, could control the distribution of the hybrids. And the hybrids could not breed true. And so farmers had to come back every year to buy those seeds. And they did it because they got such a huge performance. Right. And because it's it's an entire process to be inbreeding corn and keeping it for seed corn because you have to pull the tassels off and you have to do all this work. So people would specialize and say, I'll grow your seed for next year. You grow seed as a commodity for feed for our animals or whatever we're going to do it for. And then when you have the whenever you just take a portion of what you made off that one and then buy seeds from me next year and they'll be better and better and better because I'll be able to focus all of my time on breeding them better. The thing that I was going to make the comparison to your uh, Africa example was that I had heard that 4-H was fundamental in teaching farmers how to use hybrid corn. Um, first, how to even uh, to, to do hybridization or what it was, and then spread the word because there would a 4 H would have been a you know enormous program because this was where how do you get kids involved in teaching them about agriculture and you know it could be everything from horseback riding to livestock judging to growing corn. Yeah, well, and when you make kids the teachers, good things happen. Yeah, because they take that very seriously and they do a good job. Yeah. <laughs> Well, because they get so inspired and they believe in things and they don't let the other stuff get in their way, which actually is a good segue to the, something you brought up at the very beginning, which was you're doing light recipes. You're, 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 you're messing around with the, the way that the different light impacts plants. You're going to talk about this tomorrow at Mizzou. Tell me a little bit about that. Okay, well, let's talk about tadpoles and frogs first. So when you have a tadpole and a frog, it's exactly the same genetics, the same DNA in every cell, right? It's just that time changes this thing that is an aquatic dweller that has a tail, that feeds on algae, has a, a gills. Um, time dictates the formation of limb buds, a terrestrial habitat, absorbing the tail, uh, change in diet. That's something that's dictated by time. Plants, it's very different. If you take a seedling and you put it in the dark, it will continue to grow and do its thing, and it will not develop until it gets light cues. And specific portions of the spectrum, whether it's blue, red, green, the stuff off the edge of the red or the ultraviolet, all of those different wavelengths have different information to guide the development of that plant. So in other words, changing the, the, it's like if you took a tadpole and put it in a dark closet, it would remain a tadpole until you shined light on it. And then if you shine blue light on it, maybe it would absorb the tail. And if you shine red light on it, it would grow legs. It would be this process that different parts of the spectrum control the development. Plants are controlled by the environment because they're stuck in one place. You have to pay attention to your environmental cues and they learn about the length of the day, the proximity to neighbors, the time, maybe even season by the qualities of light they perceive. Now, because we have um, available LEDs and very cheap, narrow bandwidth radiation, we can control very narrow parts of the spectrum with great precision. Now we can start to customize the blend of lights to 
influence precisely how we want that tadpole to turn into the frog or that dark grown plant into a light grown plant. And we can control things like pigmentation, stature, nutrient accumulation, um, the, um, all, all different facets of plant biology. So instead of having to just get what you get by putting a plant in the field, we can do what's called plant whispering. We can go in and give a specific series of commands. Think of it as a vocabulary of, of commands in a language of light that dictates how that plant's going to grow and develop. So we can tell it what to do. And that's the power of this particular technology at this point. When we want to start growing plants in internal, uh, in indoor environments, in urban centers, we can use these strategies to radically change how plants grow and develop and the nutrients they have. Wow. And how far along is this research? How much is this is happening right now? Oh, it's, it's, it's exploding right now. Tons of people are looking at this and the companies are actually really doing well. Um, companies located in urban centers are producing fresh fruits and vegetables, well, fresh vegetables, mostly leafy greens and herbs that are going to urban centers at a significant um, co- uh, profit for the producer. The big problem is the energy involved to do it. And that's where my lab is really focused. Um, We've really been looking at ways to cut the energy by making plants that don't mind living in a little bit of dim light. So breeding for that environment, as well as delivering the light in pulses in very specific combinations of wavelengths that allow the plant to, um, we invest every photon more wisely. Wow. That's you think you have to think about it that way. The economy of photons, the economy of electricity used. How can we invest every single penny of that electrical cost and translate that into some sort of mass in that plant or a trait we want? And the bursts you were talking about at one time that uh, you know, lights can only or plants can only accept so much light for for a for a brief amount of time. And most of the time we have lights on in a greenhouse and the plant can't absorb the light. Anyway, well, photosynthesis has some limits as well does the so light does two things. It drives the engine and it also steers the it has and also has a foot on the gas and the brake. So different wavelengths dictate how that uh, metabolic energy coming into photosynthesis is partitioned and how it goes to do what it does. You have to think about light as controlling all facets of plant growth and development, as well as being the gas in the tank. It's a foot on the gas and a foot on the brake. That's a great analogy. And so what we've learned to do is how to specifically step on the gas and provide enough stuff to drive the engine. But without going putting extra gas in the engine to the point where the tank is overflowing and we're losing the investment. And so that's the stuff we're trying to really feather right now. I think we have identified the genetic breaks and if we can mutate the genetic breaks with gene editing this CRISPR stuff take the genetic breaks out I think we can even cut the energy more really yeah and I think that's we've demonstrated it in a rabbit opsis we haven't published it yet but it's you can make green plants you can finally make them be the green energy that we've always I I think we can do some very big things that'll be coming this is so you know I'm making a joke about something that I think of a lot which is I don't understand how agriculture didn't grab the moniker of being green energy or green, you know, the greenest thing of all. Sure. Because literally, you are taking biodegradable factories. You're, you know, f- they're grabbing sunlight and putting it into batteries and then handing it over. And the rest of the plant just goes back into the ground and reconstitutes and you can grow it again. The green industry is named after agriculture. So why is agriculture not seen as the great savior of energy and how much better we've ever been? And instead is what looks to me to be the scapegoat of, of uh, people being concerned about climate. Yeah, it's a little branding problem, isn't it? I mean, it's, it, is, it, is, it is literally built on absorbing the stuff that we produce from our cars, from us. Carbon dioxide is fixed in plants. And, you know, what does into, that mean? meaning that it, so carb, carbon dioxide is taken from the atmosphere and assimilated into other structures, molecules that we can use like sugars and, sh- and starches and, and cellulose, uh, things that form the structure of the plant as well as the metabolites we eat. And so how do you if we it is a very it's, it's literally a green energy. It's using solar power to do it. And uh, a little bit of water, a little bit of nutrient, and you can take sun's energy and remove carbon from the environment, make it into something we want. 
yeah, we've got a big branding problem. We need to rethink this. I mean, I think that part of it's a branding problem. And I think part of it goes to what we were talking before about uh, politics and tribes. And I think it is right now really easy for people in the city to believe that the people in the countryside that are growing things hate the environment or don't care about it. And uh, and they're, you know, poisoning things and they're just not as sophisticated as us living in the city. (laughs) And you see that happening when when they make assumptions that all these terrible things are like the amount of energy required to grow the crops that we're doing. The per calorie has got to be down so much more than it was before because we're so much more productive well the genetics have gone through the roof right and all this changed with Haberbosch when we were able to produce nitrogen fertilizers and then the genetics improved the hybrid corn went from 15 20 bushels of an acre back in the 1910s to 20s to now hundreds of per acre and if you really press it you can get a lot more than that right well so do you think that that prompts farmers to be um, incautious with their use of nitrogen no I think farmers have a well I, I shouldn't say that we do know of examples that I'm aware of where that's the case um, in certain horticultural crops. And I don't have to throw anybody under the bus here, but you can go and demonstrate, look, if you use a little less nitrogen, your yields go up and they'll say, yeah, but that's not the way my dad did it. And so we are fighting inertia in these industries. And I won't just paint it as all rosy and and progressive. Um, There is a lot of inertia there. But even that, even the stuff that we call inertia, my experience with. uh, So I have a buddy that's a physicist, Nick Cizik, and uh, he worked on some nitrogen projects for the Climate Corporation at Monsanto. He no longer works for him. But but uh, he talked about there is a lot about nitrogen that we just don't know like as far as how it bonds to the soil and how it does how it how 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 deep it goes and what impact does that have on root development and i guess my only point is i'm glad to hear you say that there are good actors and bad actors because there are right right right. like there, there are people that are out there misusing it and there are people that have literally no interest at all in doing the right thing for the environment, but they are doing the right thing for their pocketbook or they're doing the right thing for the number of times they can go out in their tractor. And for anybody to be like, well, you should be doing it for the environment. Like, yeah, but there's, you shouldn't fly in a plane then if that's the case. And you should give up all your things before you start telling the farmers what they should do. Yeah, you're exactly right. But the cool part is, is that when we really start to put in science and we start to understand the economic realities of farmers, we oftentimes find that the economic sustainability and the environmental sustainability align. That if we can use the best technologies, such as um, variable rate application is a huge one, you can survey a field from a satellite and see which crops are stressed from too little or too much whatever. Yeah, that's right. And then you can set your variable rate spreader to, by GPS, apply less stuff here and more stuff here, as dictated by plant health and feedback that we had from data. And so as farming becomes more data-driven, I think you'll see, because it costs farmers money to apply this stuff, Right. right? So if you can apply less, get more bang for your buck and do that by using technology as your interface, then that's a win-win. And we're seeing a lot more of that than we used to. Really? Oh yeah. Tons of that. In, in, in just the use of the, of the technology. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's off the rails. Uh, See, it's so hard for me. See, because I saw this, I saw this technology being used. I saw it in cabs because I was working for Monsanto. We were selling the technology, but I never really had a sense for how many people actually used it. Or if it just happened to be that the only farmers I ever saw were at conferences where where they were the top of the mountain you know i don't know but are people really using this technology as much as enough to make a difference oh this and much more in florida with strawberry farmers they use something called agroclimate you can look go to agroclimate.org it used to be that farmers in order to protect the crop would spray fungicide on a very regimen basis every so often you would spray you would spray you would spray just because you did prophylactic spraying Now what they figured out was you only had fungal outbreaks that were hazardous to plants after certain weather patterns. You had to have the Venn diagram of heat and humidity and weather events kind of converge in order to have that happen. So now what they do is when heat, humidity and other stuff converge, the farmer gets a text that says apply today. And it's that technology that cut application of certain fungicides by 60 to 80 percent. 
Wow. And that's huge. That's a huge win for the farmer that now doesn't have that expense of labor, fuel, and product to apply, and also the environmental impacts of having to spray something when you don't need it. So this is a win-win, and and you're only going to see more of that going forward. So speaking of going forward, um, the microbiome is talked about all the time, and it seems like that will be or is the most important thing. Hype? Is the microbiome way overhyped or is it legit? Should Is it worth the money dumping into it or is it all fool's gold? Somewhere in between. Yeah. You know, and, and I think there will be cases where we can show very strong correlations between microbiomes. And, you know, we talk Why about you human- describe a little bit about what the microbiome is with soil. Well, soil. OK, so soil is a very complicated thing and, and it's very rich in living organisms that a teaspoon of soil has more organisms than the heat planet Earth, you know, in terms of. Uh, well, it is the planet. Yeah, Earth. I was going to say, how does that can't work? do that more than people on planet Earth, maybe, you know, whatever okay. it is, billions of stuff in a tablespoon of soil and the composition there dictates quite a bit about the fertility and uh, and health of that soil and what they're learning now is that different associations of bacteria with roots of plants we've known this for a long time have profound consequences in the plant's health resistance to disease sometimes ability to fix nitrogen that kind of thing um and so understanding the soil bacteria and then being able to manipulate that does seem to be a place where it looks like we'll be able to have some breakthroughs including um, colonizing plants, colonizing a seed with the bacteria that as that plant develops may fix atro- atro- atmospheric nitrogen to fertilize the seed. So you wouldn't have to apply nitrogen anymore, which means you're not having to apply nitrogen and have all the runoff. You don't have to make it, which takes carbon to do through Haber-Bosch. Um, you would have the plant basically fertilize itself from bacteria that are now resident. And that looks like something that's very realistic in the next 10 years. And so that's you actually you you landed right where I was going to ask you, which is you think this is realistic. Um, you know, there's a lot of promise with things like the microbiome or the, the microbiota. Like it, th- there's a lot of like we think it's controlling depression and all of these other things. But then again, it becomes like a scapegoat instead of putting all of your fears on it. You're putting all of your hopes on it. So how much how much hope should people be putting on the microbiome? I don't I would be I would never put hope on too many things like that because it's one part of a complicated situation, right? It's it's a multi, all of these many of these diseases especially or you know disorders things like autism especially where people have said, well, it's a it's part of the microbiome gut access with the brain. It's um it's it may be a contributing factor or maybe a predisposition or something that enhances a genetic or environmental combination, or who knows. But I don't know that there's any silver bullets here at this point. What I would say is that if we had this conversation in 2009, we would not say the word CRISPR, unless it was referring to a drawer in our refrigerator. Right. We wouldn't talk about gene editing. All of the, every, all of the things that we're doing now that are accelerating the lead edge of biology are all discoveries in the last six, seven years, five, six, seven years. And it goes at, at, a, at a massive, massive rapid pace. So I think we're going to see profound change in agriculture. I think we're going to see profound change in medicine and the discoveries that are happening at a breakneck pace. The question now is, are we going to be moving as fast as to be able to use them with the correct wisdom to use them properly. And I think that's going to be our big challenge. Yeah, that may be the challenge of what we started talking about with, hey, you're going to start throwing wrenches in here. You know, there's a there's a famous phrase, beware of unearned wisdom, right? Where where you've discovered something, but you didn't discover it because you um, yeah, you just stumbled upon it, right? And it kind of sounds like that's what, what you're talking about. But if there's one person on the earth that has a lot of uh, earned wisdom about the subject of communicating complicated science, like your wrench example, it's you. And you've been through the the fire of having um, things go wrong. And and uh, and well, so let's let me just kind of set the scene. Is it you want to talk about this for a little bit? Yeah, OK, yeah. sure, sure, sure. So um, 
So for anybody that doesn't know, Kevin is somewhat of a controversial figure. In fact, I, when I announced this morning that I was going to be interviewing you, I got some pokes from people that said, you know, what's going on, Kevin? I thought he quit Twitter and I thought he quit this. But this is the end of a story that's actually much, much longer. You and I met five or six years ago and uh, you were one of the only scientists that would get any coverage at all about explaining complex science like GMOs or pesticides or what farmers were doing. And in fact, either right before or right after we met, you were on the Joe Rogan experience, you know, the the pinnacle of podcasts. Even then it was a big deal and now it's an even bigger deal. And now you've come all the way to people, you winning the CAST award, the, the, the communicators in agriculture, science and technology. Um, and, and now things have happened along the way. Uh, what do you think you've learned along your rough path where things were going really well? And then you find yourself on the front page of the New York times being pointed out where they're trying to make the case that you're, you've done something nefarious. Um, you can't quit. And I think you have to keep your focus of why are you doing what you're doing? And, you know, it would be, it would be easy to quit so many times. But when we talk about the, um, those situations in Africa and seeing it firsthand and knowing of solutions that can happen here and sitting at a time and place in history where we have an opportunity to create an engine to do tremendously good things for people. And I said it yesterday to, to a class of med school students. We don't lack from us uh, from innovation. We've got plenty of innovation. It doesn't get to application because we don't have good communication. And so um, for me, it's, it's about you have to be fearless and tireless and take this on and keep going. I almost quit so many times, especially after that New York Times article. That was life changing. It destroyed relationships. It is some simple as getting me kicked off of a local bike club um, to um, threats and hassle, taking my name off my office, people breaking into my office, uh, having to have security present at the university my boss having to have conversations with the FBI domestic terrorism task force when I was giving a talk at another university that, um, and then if you go on Google, Google images and put my name in, you won't stop laughing or crying, um, because it's horrible. And, and I mean, it got, it, it was bad. And like, yeah. And, yeah. and so there are places out there, people could go look it up and, you, um, uh, on on the name that you have and I guess one of the things because we only have a limited amount of time before my recording actually runs out but um, what do you think you learned along this way what is the earned wisdom that you have now having gone through the 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 ecstasy of being at the top of the world to to being thrown all the way to the bottom and all the other things that have happened what's the earned wisdom that you have now to impart yeah I think the most important part is um what do you what do you think you what do you wish you would have done differently earlier? Yeah, I I think being more um, aggressively transparent, meaning throwing every single card on the table in ways that everybody could see it and not make any inference, not allow them to control my story and be more visible with that and be. Uh, more active in explaining what things actually are rather than turning it over to someone with ill intent to say what they think it is. Um, I would like to, I should have started a scientist defense fund, <laughs> legal defense fund. Um, there's a lot of things that should have been done. Before. I don't, I, I'm, I don't think you should have been more transparent. I, I like, I think that that is, um, I think that's a weird expectation that people had of you or of anybody else to to say, like, we want you to disclose every um, every aspect of your life. And if we find something that is not exposed, then we're going to we're going to we're going to do it and we're going to frame it in such a way that's bad for you. If your answer is, well, then I should have done more. The yeah. only thing that that would be is you're playing a game that, that, that they set up all the rules and then you happen to play it well enough that they couldn't get you. That doesn't seem no, right. You're right. I mean, they all, they would have found something no matter what. And that's what they're doing still today. Um, they continually take more and more of my stuff. I have more transparency than anybody. And, and that you can get my emails just by asking for them. And 
So, I, so then I guess I would ask, what is the change that either yeah. you, you wish you would have made earlier? What's the one you have to make now? Yeah, that's really, I think you have to decide where you want to be. And I think back then I didn't know, you know, I was a semi relevant scientist in a few uh, relatively irrelevant areas. And I was good at what I did there and I could have stayed there and done that. But I wanted to venture into this idea of communicating the science because I had a knack for it and thought that I could help move the needle on the innovations we wanted to reach people that I believe in. And I really do feel can help people. And I didn't know what I, what I needed to do to get there. I just did it without maybe a goal and a plan. And I think that if I would have been more strategic about this, I wouldn't have allowed others to get me that way. Yeah. I mean, I mean, candidly, and you and I have always been close and I've told you what I've thought all along. I, I, I assume that's what you do with me. I think that there is a very, very fine line between confidence and uh, arrogance. And I know that before I met you, it's it's weird, right? Like you have these heroes, these people you see online, you see on Twitter, you see them give talks. You, I saw you on Joe Rogan and then you and I met down in Yuma, Arizona, and you were an actual person. And I, I think even I had the experience of being like, oh my gosh, this person that I've heard of that is this uh, amazing person is uh, is a real person and I got to see what you were doing on the inside as as being brave right you would stand up in places where I certainly wasn't going to but on some level do you think there was a time when you were maybe taking on projects or programs or positions that was foolhardy oh yeah I think that there was a little bit of cockiness to it uh, quite often and I think I was often abrasive. Um, I would come off as you, you know, telling people, you know, you idiot. I can't believe you would say that. I mean, there was a lot of those instances. And there was a communications fail, like horribly. But it was kind of like I knew a lot about this. I, I mean, I was really an expert's expert. I know this stuff inside and out. I've studied it my whole life, literally. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean and, I've met everybody and, in the in the science communication world. There's nobody that comes anywhere close to your ability to explain things. No doubt about that. Well, and I understand this stuff so well. But the problem was, is that I was come taking that mantle of as a science fist and just, you know, knocking people out with it. I wasn't taking, I, and that goes back to what we're saying about listening and trying to um, change the way people feel. I was able to give people more facts and more information. And that made me come off as extremely arrogant um, at times. And I would never want to be seen that way. Cause that's not the way I am. I think there was also a time. Um, and you tell me if you still feel this way, we may have a difference of opinion on this, but I feel like, um, you took the mantle of being a public uh, university professor as a thing that says, I have more responsibility here, therefore I have to hold myself to some kind of account. And But that can sometimes be used like a, a, like a little bit of a stick. Like, how, how, can, how can you question my, my integrity? I'm a university um, professor. I'm a, I'm a, I work for you. Well, you don't work for me. Right. Like, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And I do that. And I still believe that, though. <laughs> I mean, that's I, mean, I think that's where our difference but, of opinion but, is. But see, you're the taxpayer that funds my research and you're the taxpayer that funds, you know, uh, you, you, granted, you know, you don't live in Florida, but st state of Florida pays my salary. Um, you put students in the school in the classrooms where I teach. So I do feel a very strong sense of uh, responsibility to that taxpayer and to that enterprise that allows me to do what I do. I think that maybe, you know, as you're describing it, I think it's that um, I'm more cynical than you yeah. because I feel like, uh, you know, after I went to the World Bank and I saw what international organizations that, that get paid in the same similar situation, like we are given tax dollars by company or by countries and then the countries pay into the World Bank and those people pay your salaries. Therefore, I'm working for you. And I saw people doing crazy stuff there that I didn't want anything to do with. And, uh, and so I don't hold any position in my mind as if you paid by the taxpayer, you're paid by, it, it all comes down to you as an individual. And that the fact that you work for a university holds no sway over me at all. Okay. I'm with you. So let's just say that the moral act of 1862 that created the land grant system <laughs> never was written. 
and I was sitting here, would I feel a commitment to it the same way? That's yeah, right. I would. That's I would. A, okay. And and maybe it's because it's doing the right thing. Okay. And maybe it's a profound sense of wanting to do the right thing. And at least what I feel is the right thing. And so I have to consult my, you know, moral compass and hope that's good. And I stand to be corrected when I'm off. And I have been. I'm corrected all the time. You correct me a lot, you know, and I appreciate that. Well, I also think the other thing that people don't understand about you, and that's what I'm really hoping this podcast uh, conversation gives people a feel for, is that you are actually first and foremost an actual legit hardcore scientist that is cranking down on research and new ideas and pushing thing, pushing the envelope of what is known in the world. And I think most people came to you through the route of communicator that is saying things and helps us understand. And, and I think most people had no way of understanding how many things you're doing all at once. Like, <laughs> like you're a, you're a man on fire f- falling out of a, a building and still writing papers while you're on your way down. Well, and I was a administrator. I was the department chair of the number nine department in the world in what we do in fruits and vegetables, you know, in plant biology. And uh, I did that for five and a half years and was extremely successful in rebuilding a department and hiring new people and, um, you know, mentoring um, and budgeting and managing and being in the resident psychologist. I did that for five and a half years in addition to research and in addition to doing, um, you know, 50 speaking dates a year. And so, yeah, it was, it was, People who know me from any, and so it's so funny is researchers don't know that I go teach science communication workshops. Oh, really? Yeah, they have no idea. And science communication people don't know that I have a prolific research program. And oftentimes people who knew me from university administration didn't know I did anything else. So it was um, compartmentalizing those different magisteria of what I did that allowed me to... Um, I get a really diverse toolbox also kept me busy for years. Well, your, your amount of production is something that has at many times in my life said, told me I'm not doing enough. I want to be doing more. I want to be getting more done because I saw how much you pack into a day. In fact, you have a podcast yourself that just crossed the 1 million downloads? Yeah, just crossed 1 million downloads. So yeah. talk about your podcast. What do you do on there and how long you've been doing it? Uh, it's, uh, it? I did it right after Joe Rogan. Um, he was, so many people for years told me I had to do a podcast and I did my first one incognito with the Vern Blathick, the Ion Power Hour. That was the first one. That was the first one. And I did that because I didn't want to do a podcast as Kevin Fulta. I didn't want that spotlight. Mostly because um, others would say, well, we needed you to review these NSF proposals and you said you couldn't do it, but you had time to do your stupid podcast. So I did it anonymously <laughs> and I did it as a satire and a spin off the Art Bell show from the 1990s overnight radio. And we know that broke bad. But then no, I, most people don't know that. I mean, like well, the people in your world know it. The yeah. people a lot in the farming and ag world, but the other people, they have no idea that. You could create as a as a scientist that normally is working in the office. You're doing all these research papers. You start a podcast after you're on the Joe Rogan experience, but you have an alter ego of a weirdo that you name Vern Blazik. Uh, Vern Blazik, science and, power, and it's word. super super goofy. It's, it's kind of a goofy take on science, and it wasn't terribly serious. That's but it, right. But it was really funny because, and you can still hear it online. Um, but. The idea was was to do science communication with a little bit of theatrical and have good. Si- so instead of it being like the original show, the Art Bell show, which was bad science and a legitimate host, making this a legitimate science screwy host. Right. And that got um, a whistle blown on it when I asked a journalist if she would be on to talk about her book. And she said, well, I don't understand this. This is a breakdown in transparency. This is and this is right after the New York Times story on me being a corporate lobbyist. So she used that to throw me under. the So bus. so to clarify, you're running this podcast. You're just kind of having fun. You're having on a bunch of the people that you have relationships with that you've known for a long time. You invited me on it. I knew yeah. that you were Vern Blazik and uh, I ended up not doing it. I don't even remember why. But the the uh, you then have a New York Times article that comes out and w- w- that's a podcast. We should we should just do an entire episode <laughs> on it. But an article comes out about you and then and then a, that's really negative that, that portrays you as being, you know, really connected with Monsanto um, in nefarious yeah. ways, um, which 
I know is not true. You and I have a friendship developed because I was working at Monsanto and we happened to intersect. We became friends, but that's why we're connected. Not, not anything else. Um, and then you invite this woman on to your podcast that's a journalist onto the Vern Blazik Power Hour to talk about a story that she's done about, was it bats or cockroaches well, I, or I, something? I don't want, well, do I want to throw No, 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 no that's so fine. We don't I don't even to. want to talk about it. her area of specialty and I thought it would be a great topic because it's right. kind of funny, you know. And then she said, I don't understand what this is. Why would you do this? This is, I don't understand. She uh, got so outraged and was like, you know, and then she writes an article about me that says, um, the art, original title was, um, uh, you know, an, a diary of a Monsanto apologist. That's right. And then after I said to her, that's kind of a stretch for a title, isn't it? The morning it came out, I was really upset. And it was in Buzzfeed, wasn't it? Oh yeah. It? Yeah. And I wrote on Twitter, I said, why would you call it that? You know, she goes, it was purely to feed off the other article and to throw me under the bus as hard as she could. That's what it was. And, um, and she said, well, I didn't write the, the headline. I just wrote the story. I said, well, how is that different than me? doing a podcast incognito, you know? And so she changed it to, you know, seed money or something. It was, it was really, really uncool. And, and so then from there you flipped over and started doing talking Talking biotech. biotech. I had to do it, do it legit. And I started doing it as, as Kevin Fulton and talking biotech. And, um, now we're up to 209 episodes went up yesterday and, uh, and, uh, over a million downloads and it comes out every Saturday morning, no matter what. It is insane how much you've put out there, how much content you've put out there, how much you've helped students get a chance to, to learn how to do their own podcasting. The one episode that I think, is it Gregor Larson that does the domesticated, uh, wolves into dogs? Yeah. That was an awesome podcast, especially the second half when he really starts hammering down on how did how did we domesticate wolves into dogs? That one blew my mind. Yeah, he did a domestication of chickens also, which was great. Oh, I haven't yeah, heard that he one. had a domestication of chickens and then I had domestication of cats from another um, scientist. But we do a lot of talk about domestication of animals and plants. How did it get from the wild to here? I love those stories and I need to do more of them. Yeah, they're amazing. I'm reading uh, Temple Grandin's book right now, one of them. Uh, like Animals Make Us Human, I yes. think is the one it's called. And uh, it's phenomenal how she's talking about how we domesticated these various animals. These are just exceptional stories and they're parts of your everyday life. And that's what I love about your show is that, yes, it is scientific, but it's talking about subjects that are all around you that are that are that that you think you know a lot about you think you know what a diabetic is or how, where insulin comes from you listen to this and you have your mind blown or, or genetics in general so yeah no i had um uh is it santonio holmes he's a super bowl mvp contacted me a few weeks ago because his son has sickle cell disease and he is part of a sickle cell foundation i did a podcast on new remedies for sickle cell anemia and he wants to know more about it so I was able to connect him with the relevant people. That is fantastic. So the the podcast has incredible penetration and the fact that so many people share it and find the content, maybe they don't care about the last episode, but you can go into this lazy Susan of science and pick out something you like. And there's a story in there for everyone. And the, some of the, and it's the guests that are great, by the way, I just ask questions. The guests are so good. And I, and I've just been so blessed to be able to talk to such a great array of wonderful people people in that in in that series i absolutely love it well i mean when you told me you got a million downloads that nothing could make me happier and the fact that this all started out of the ashes of uh having a lot of your uh your life uh, get burned to the ground so I'm, i think we should wrap it up here um let's go hang out some more before you have to take off <laughs> to go to mizzou but thank you so much for coming by the studio no, this is the I absolute best you. you're the best thank you so much thanks kevin Well, that's going to do it for this week's interview with Dr. Kevin Fulta. We didn't mention it, but he is a prolific user of social media. So he's on Twitter, Instagram, and he has a Facebook page. I hope you will go check him out and also go check out the Talking Biotech podcast. It's an excellent podcast. I would say I've probably listened to about 40% of the episodes. There's almost always something in each one of the episodes that makes me say, oh, Now I understand the world a little bit better, and I find myself saying, well, actually, at parties when when the subject of one of his podcasts comes up, 
So if you like this interview, I hope you will come back on Wednesdays. Consider subscribing here. You know that on Fridays, I do an episode of what we call As the Crow Flies, where I talk about a communication strategy, philosophy, or tactic that can help you become a tangibly better communicator. If you're interested in this and you want to learn more, you can always check out my website, vancecrow.com, to learn more, or just hop over to Twitter, find me there, and have some interactions. One of my favorite things to do is to get a DM from a listener that says, hey, I heard this particular episode. It meant a lot to me and I just wanted to let you know. So either let me know about a podcast interview that particularly struck you or if you don't want to reach out to me, do me an even bigger favor, which is consider sending an episode that makes you think of a friend. Send it to somebody that you care about. Get them to check out this podcast because maybe it'll be one that they fall in love with and they want to listen to and they can become a part of this community that we are building. Every single week, the numbers go up on Facebook. I see way more interactions on Twitter and our subscriptions are going up, up, up. We just had our 10,000th download earlier this week and I'm really excited about that and getting up to the next milestone which I guess is probably a hundred thousand so we'll be back on Friday for an as the crow flies episode and Wednesday with another interview thanks so much for joining me